Welcome to Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries, dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching and teaching the word of God from the preserved and fallible King James Bible of 1611. Alright, so... I'm going to be doing one last response to Ola uh, McClurg here. He um, came out with this video, basically a response to me and everything. And we're just going to go over everything he says and just uh, pick apart, uh, pick it apart piece by piece, as simple as that. But first I'm going to start off with this scripture. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 10, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So you see, um, when it comes to... Uh, exposing heretics and proving their their heresies false and everything, you're really only supposed to give them two admonitions. Then after that, you have to reject them because they're not willing to repent. They're not going to repent. And if you keep on going on about it, it's just going to basically increase unto more ungodliness. You know, you can move on. You can do a good refutation of somebody just two times and then move on from them. If anybody still wants to believe after two refutations and proving them a liar by the scriptures, then that's on them. And they're not seeking after the Lord. They're seeking after whatever they want to hear. They have itching ears, like the Bible says. They will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into this. So here's a few things he uh, had to say and a few uh, scriptures he went over. I have a couple of things I'm going to go over in this. Uh, I just want to link in the description to a video that I think you really need to watch. You really need to watch it because it shows the mindset of a King James Onlyist. Um, an extreme King James only is. Now, the kid in the video, uh, this young kid, um, is denies the Trinity, which we know that if you deny the Trinity, that's the first sign, according to any uh, um, acknowledged apologist, the first sign of a cult is the denial of... Acknowledged apologist? So your authority is a scholar and or apologist, not the scriptures, not what the Bible says, just what... Some apologist says and what the Roman Catholic Church came up with. And on top of all that, uh, there's a lot of cults out there that do believe in the Trinity, by the way. Uh, that's not proof at all of any kind of cult. But good try. The triunity of God, the Trinity of God. Uh, God is, you know, three persons, yet one God, monotheism. Um, yeah, and you know, that same heresy is the reason why a lot of Jews today will not get saved. They can't, they reject monotheism. But let, you know, just forget everything the Old Testament has to say. You know, you're, you're three persons and everything, you know, which it doesn't make any sense. You know, three separate persons, yet one God. When there's three parts to God, a body, soul, and a spirit, one God, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But, you know, you don't want to touch that. You don't want to go over that. You just want to stick to your philosophy and your apologetics, your, your little apologists that have the authority, quote-unquote, because this man's authority is not the scriptures anymore. He uses any Bible he wants to get his hands on, so he has no final authority. So he has to turn to scholars and apologists for all of his information. But let's continue. What he does is he, he says that he, he doesn't even play the whole video of me, but what they do is what's called ad hominem attacks. In other words, they're, they're going to attack or make up some kind of attack on my character rather than dealing with the issue because they can't deal with the text itself. Uh, he brings up uh, some of the comments that he put up, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Now, according to his line of reasoning in eschatology, um, that, that very text that he uses proves there is no secret rapture. In fact, and he's not going to quote the whole verse. He's been trained. This is how, this is how it works when it comes to... It does not disprove the pre-trib rapture, but let's let him keep on uh, spewing his heresy. I don't know what the... My, okay, so I'm an itch in my neck. But I, I don't know... Uh, uh, I do know that these guys are trained this way. Um, and, and it's done in just a, a simple... Um, I guess, you, you know, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but, it, I mean, it is brainwashing. Ruckman had a way of... of of brainwashing people. In other words, if you didn't agree with him, you're either lost or insane or stupid is what pretty much what he would do, and he'd ingrain that into his students. Well, now that people have read Ruckman's materials, which I do not recommend anybody reads Ruckman's materials, um, unless you're an apologist, because it's, it, I'll be reading a lot of that in the future anyways, uh, just 
going through it and showing you how foolish Ruckman was in his theology. But so they're trained to use ad hominem attacks. I mean, that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to set up a lot of what we call straw men. You know, something that just that there's nothing there and it, it just burns up with a match. But you'll you'll see that that's what he uses in the video. But let me talk to you, Tim. Tim, listen. You said that there's a secret rapture, right? So you don't deny a secret rapture. I say there is no secret rapture. You say, Tim, that there's a seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, which if you actually took that in its context, in the proper dispensational viewpoint, you'd realize that the time of Jacob's trouble would be the second half of the seven-year tribulation. It's only three and a half years. But you don't understand dispensationalism, do you? Because you've been taught by Brian Denlinger. Now listen, Tim. If oh, actually, I do understand dispensationalism, and the three and a half years you're talking about is what a lot of the students of Pensacola Bible Institute are coming out with, the whole thing of Ray Donovan. I've, I've read all that, okay? <laughs> you know, you, do, you don't understand dispensationalism. Yes, I do. I've been studying this stuff for about since I, since I got saved, about a year after I got saved. And I know these arguments, and I actually will be doing a podcast in the future with a, a good brother in the Lord actually on the seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble. And it is seven years. It's not three and a half years. And we will be proving that in the future in a future podcast. So for all the brethren watching, be sure and stay tuned for that. But what I'm covering here in this is his whole attack on the secret rapture because he has no idea what he's talking about. And we're going to show this a little here, here in a little bit. If you really believe that there's a seven-year tribulation period, and then there's a literal millennial reign, and then Jesus Christ resurrects the dead, you don't understand the passage that you quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because according to my viewpoint, <clears throat> what the Bible actually teaches, now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's go back to verse 26, Tim. Tim, look at verse 26. What does it say the last enemy that is going to be defeated? It says the last enemy that will be abolished is death. According to your eschatology, Tim, the first enemy to be defeated is death by the rapture. We should not all sleep. We should not all die, right? Tim, you have it backwards. Think about what I said. Read it in context. Proper exegesis. Use proper hermeneutics. Those. Sure. You want proper exegesis? Let's do it right now. Okay. So he wants to go to the passage I quoted, which is first. Let's see here. Okay, for 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 54. Okay, so. Verses 50 to 54. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption, incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And again, you know, the sting, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you see right here, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And death is swallowed up in victory. See, what you have to understand is that there are three parts to the resurrection. There's three parts to it. They're all separate events, but three parts. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 to 26. So literally, just up, just above where Paul started saying these things. So begin in verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Now let's start with that part right there. Christ the first fruit. So what is that talking about? Go to Matthew chapter 27 verses 52 to 53. Verses 52 to 53. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints 
which slept, arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, Jesus Christ's resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Yeah, many. So, what, what were you saying? The, uh, the, the last uh, thing to be a de defeat is death. So, I guess the Gospels right here are literally betraying your little view of eschatology, which is just heresy. Stop calling it eschatology. It's heresy. You're a heretic. I mean, give me a break here. So you see right here, the graves were open. There were Old Testament saints that rose with Jesus Christ. That is Christ the first fruits, all the way there in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 21 to 26. That is the first part of the, res of the resurrection. Let's go back there. 1 Corinthians 21, uh, 15, verses 21 to 26. And then afterward, they that are Christ at his coming... That is us. That is the church. That is the secret rapture. They that are Christ at his coming. And you can find that in the passage I quoted earlier, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 50, 54. That is the rapture, and that is the next part of the resurrection. That is what we are waiting for. We are waiting to be raptured before the time of Jacob's trouble begins. Now go to Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them in judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Three parts. Three parts to it. It's as simple as that. And the last part is right here. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, that be us and Old Testament saints, the ones that rose with Jesus, and then us who were caught up before the book of Revelation came to pass, because it didn't pass in 70 AD. Uh, but continuing. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And then jump down to Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and he that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See right there, works and faith in that time period also. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the last part of the first resurrection. Go back to First Corinthians, First uh, Corinthians fifteen verses twenty-one to twenty-six. Verse 24, then, co then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of kingdom to God, even the Father, when, she, he have sh shall put, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Three parts to the first resurrection. It's as simple as that. And it says right there, millennial kingdom, after the millennial kingdom, death is delivered up. Death is destroyed, right here on this one passage. The Old Testament saints that rose to Jesus in the Gospels. Us that are raptured when the Lord comes to catch us up. And those who were resurrected and cast into hell and death and, it's, and hell itself are cast into hell in the lake of fire. There you go. Three parts of the resurrection, all right there. The secret rapture is scriptural and it is completely and utterly 100% true. And with that being said, we're going to go on to the next part of this. Okay, so in this next part, we're going to be going over his recent video uh, titled Revelation, Fact or Fiction. And this is just, this is when it gets really funny. I mean, this is just, this is when post-millennialism gets really nutty. And we'll go ahead and let the nuttiness uh, speak for itself. So did John the Revelator just jump the gun 
maybe he was antsy and really wanting the kingdom to come in soon, but maybe he was wrong too. I don't think he was. Let's go over some verses in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. Was he antsy? Chapter 3, or verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Why would they be blessed if they took heed to the words which were spoken? Maybe they could escape judgment that Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24. Chapter 3, Revelation, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come. That was a promise to that specific church. See, here, here we go. And it's important to note he is not reading out of the King James Bible, and he's completely changing the text. I mean, that's, uh, that's the biggest uh, flaw in this whole thing. Let's go to the actual real Bible, the King James Bible of 1611, and read what it has to say. The real word of God in the English language for English-speaking people. Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that are dwell upon the earth. So you see right there what it says, and word of my patience, not perseverance. And also, where does it say shortly come? Where is any of that in this verse? You see, he's, he's reading out of a new version, and if it says that, then, you know, it's again, it's just a Vatican corruption. They're just Vatican counterfeits. That's exactly what they are. But um, let's continue through his uh, nuttiness. So, like, was John just dancing, maybe? Or is God's word perfect, pure, and prophetic? Which one? You're using a new version. You believe in all these hundreds of new versions now that they're all the Word of God. Which one is the perfect Word of God? Uh, the Lord promised to preserve His words, and they are preserved in the King James Bible of 1611, regardless of what your scholars like to say, the Alexandrian school of thought. Completely satanic and heretical. And again, you know, he's talking about the Word of God being pure, but he doesn't believe in that because he's using new versions. He has no standard except himself. And when it's prophetic, does it come to pass? Oh, he bet you does. How about chapter 6, verse 11? Then there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Here we go again. Let's go to that verse in the King James Bible. Revelation 6, 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, not for a, for a little uh, for a short time or whatever his new version is saying. You see again, a little season. A season is a certain amount of time that goes by. A season, you know, winter, fall, summer, things like that. Season, a longer period of time. He's making it sound like it was going to happen right then and there because he needs to prove his heresy. Well, let's continue. Just a little while longer, and he would bring in judgment upon the people that were slain. That were slain. How about chapter 10, verse 6? And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be no delay that there will be delay no longer. Here we go. And again, he's, he's reading from a Bible corruption, and this is where he's trying to get away with it. Now go to Revelation 10.6 10, in a King James Bible again. Revelation 10.6 And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. No longer time. No more time, meaning eternity. You know, I know that's hard for us to grasp. We're just, um, you know, we're not in eternity and stuff, and we can't imagine the idea of no concept of time. 
but that's what it's saying, time no longer. It's not saying it's shortly coming to pass. You see, these new versions are satanic and heretical, and they also come from the Vatican. You would think there'd be a little bit of amimillennial bias also injected into the text due to it being from the Vatican, the Vatican versions, but, you know, post-millennialists like him is not going to talk about that. We shouldn't, you know, there's no bias. Of course not. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, this is laughable. But continuing. Let's come back. Chapter 12, verse 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. A short time from the time that was written. See, where does it say that? A short time from the time that was written. You see, here we go with this with this junk. Again, uh, Revelation uh, 12 and verse 12 is what he just read. Um, Therefore rejoice, O ye, uh, rejoice ye heavens, and ye, shall, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So, again, this is during when the seals are opening. And when did the seals open in 70 AD? They didn't. When did a third of the trees burn up? They didn't. None of that happened in 70 AD. And the first one to come at the first seal is the white horse rider. If you do a cross-reference with the King James Bible, the white horse rider is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ because he appears later on in Revelation on his white horse. It's the Antichrist trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ. And it says that he goes out, he goes conquering and to conquer. Again, and it go it lines right up with the with Thessalonians talk about that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. You know that is the whole cross reference. That is exactly what's happening there, and that's when the devil is coming down around those seals. Again, you see, he's he's completely changing the text and trying to say that it was for back then and for for then. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Postmillennialism is nutty nonsense. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 16. Actually, not Revelation chapter 16. That's, uh, that's Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Again, and let's let's go ahead and read that out of the King James yet again, just to prove how much of a heretic he really is. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 6. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord of God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And again, you see his different version messes it up. But this is, again, this is Revelation. Revelation is not happening right now. That's the whole thing. He's trying to make it sound like it happened in the past when it did not. It absolutely did not. These are seals that must be opened that God is going to open and bring judgment on the lost world and on the nation of Israel for the rejection of Jesus Christ when he came the first time. That is the whole point of the book of Revelation. If you just do a simple plain reading, you see that it's Israel that needs to turn back to God. Cross-reference it with the verses in Zechariah of them looking upon him whom they have pierced. You know, it all lines up, and it's for the time of Jacob's trouble. It is for Israel. When did Israel turn to Jesus Christ during, uh, during any of those times in 70 AD? They did not. They still reject, reject Jesus Christ to this day. That's why judgment will be coming upon them in the future. Revelation is in the future. Do you have that? Do you understand that? Obviously he doesn't, because he's a post-millennialist and he doesn't want to repent. Verse 10. For the time is near. Verse 12. I am coming quickly. And he ends off with Revelation. He who verse 20 of chapter 22. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Is John the Revelator a false prophet? No, but you are, <laughs> 100%. I mean, 
Yeah, just just listen to what he said. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, which is what the what the Bible says, uh, what the true King James Bible of sixteen eleven says. That's the the English, the perfect word of God in the English language. But again, this whole thing of you know was was John a liar and stuff like that. You know, the Bible says in uh, the epistles of Peter that a, one day to, one day to God is as a thousand years, basically. So. There is a certain, so God's concept of time is different from ours, and that's why it's taking, that's why it may seem like a long time to us, but to him it's only a few days, because the time works differently in heaven. It's, it's very evident. And here he goes. He's trying to say that everything happened in 70 AD, which is kind of funny, because he just read a passage, you know, saying, talking about the Lord coming quickly, and yet he also, in his post-millennial heresy, he believes that the church has to bring in a golden age of peace and prosperity before the Lord can even come back. So he doesn't even, I mean, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. I mean, if you're, if you're following this guy, you need to run away. You need to run away. Get yourself a King James Bible the, in the, uh, the perfect word of God, perfectly preserved, and study it for yourself and rightly divide with the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to this devil. Don't listen to this fool and this postmillennial heresy. And this is complete and utter heresy. It's not a different view or anything like that. It contradicts Scripture. And you have to travel outside of Scripture in order to prove it. He's a heretic. But continuing. No. Everything he said was going to come to pass came to pass. And blessed were those, and to us who read it, it blesses us, but for them it blessed them and took heed to the warnings that are given in Revelation. Old Jerusalem was destroyed, 70 AD, and Jesus Christ brought in the new Jerusalem, the new covenant church. And everything that John said in Revelation, well, Almost everything, except for the second advent and the judgment. Well, almost everything. Did you see how, you know, he's he's literally getting away with talking like that, that double tongue speak, that forked tongue, you know, just like a devil. Well, almost everything came to pass. No, the fact of the matter is, is the book of Revelation has yet to come to pass, and it will become to pass in the future. But your postmillennial your post heresy is wrong, and it's so easy to disprove from Scripture. It's hilarious that you even make a video like this. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Just everything he's saying. And then he said that New Jerusalem is now, so the church is New Jerusalem on earth. Well, that's kind of funny, because the last time I checked, there's still starving people on the streets. There's still uh, diseases floating around, AIDS, um, you know, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, strokes, cancers. Uh, where, you know, shouldn't all that be gone if we're in the New Jerusalem? I mean, never mind about the Millennial Kingdom. I guess he isn't and you know, we just completely skipped over that. No, we're in New Jerusalem right now, which the Bible clearly states comes from heaven. The Lord brings it down from heaven. You know, it's an actual city measuring it's a certain amount of measurements and everything. You can actually get measurements out of the King James Bible by cross-referencing it. I mean, what a heretic. I mean, you got to just for anyone to fall for this stuff is 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 insane. I mean, he's lost. The spirit of the Holy Spirit of God does not indwell in this man or else he wouldn't be believing this heresy. It's it's again, it's laughable. Final judgment, almost everything in Revelation was completely fulfilled. But he makes it clear the things that were not fulfilled. And so does the text of Scripture. But John, the Revelator, was correct. And Jesus Christ came in judgment and brought his kingdom with him. He is king now, and like I said before, this earth is his footstool. We have no reason not to get involved in political reason. In political things. And here we go. Now he's promoting the whole idea of getting involved in politics and things. And that's the whole thing of bringing in the kingdom and all this stuff, the postmillennial heresy. He's just a heretic. It's as simple as that. And it's been proven throughout this video. So with that being said, that's the last admonition for Brian McClurg. He is a heretic and he is on his way to hell. And you do your, you do uh, right to stay far away from his channel and his heretical views. But with that being said, that is the end of this video. I pray this is a blessing to you out there and to any new brothers in Christ. And with that being said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Old Jerusalem was destroyed, 70 AD, and Jesus Christ brought in the new Jerusalem, the new covenant church. <laughs> You serious?